Britain has had a special association with the city of Basra for over 400 years. Ever since the East India Company first established a trading relationship there early in the 17th century. Over the past decade, during a time when Iraq has been faced with many political and economic challenges, that association has been renewed and strengthened by an imaginative UK-Iraq collaborative venture to transform one of Saddam Hussein's former palaces on the banks of the great waterway of the Shat al-Arab in southern Iraq into a new historical and archaeological museum for Basra and the wider region. On the Iraqi side, despite threats to his personal safety, Kahtan al-Abid has dedicated his life to safeguarding Iraq's rich history and its identity. He was instrumental in the development of the new museum. He told me, Kahtan, look, no any archaeology uh, archaeologist in Basra. And he said, you have to work with the antiquities police as a civilian supervisor. That was 2005. 2007, I got my approval to be a full-time uh, employee because the, the director who was working in the department in that time was killed. We was working for uh, protecting the archaeological site and take out the squatters. Uh, especially from the Office of the Antiquities, which is the original Basra Museum. We was working hardly for that, and it was very dangerous in 2006 because there was a religious war in Iraq, and there was no any police or law or army or any, I mean, the government was very weak in that time, and they shoot us. We was driving together because we got the building uh, from them because they was living there. In the, in the office. We took back the Department of Antiquities and they sent the letter with, you know, saying some dangerous things for us and we will do that, we will do that. We, you know, we say it doesn't matter, they are just speaking and they want to just, you know, make us a fair and for using the palace of Saddam Hussein also it's a different message for the Iraqis and for the wars. This building was a tutorial symbol and sign and now civilization symbol. And that means always the humanity will be win. The memorial of the people and the families who was killed by Saddam Hussein will be changed now. It will be for culture, for peace, and for protecting them uh, identity, which was Saddam working hardly to, to remove them identity. On the British side, at a time when relations between the military and archaeological communities had sadly reached a low point following the 2003 invasion of Iraq, Dr John Curtis had the vision to rebuild this relationship and encourage the British military to leave a positive legacy in Iraq by helping to preserve and protect Iraq's cultural heritage. The story actually really starts at two, in 2007 when Barney White Spunner, who was going to be in charge of the British troops about to be deployed to Iraq, came to the British Museum and Barney White Spunner, very enlightened actually, explained that he was about to go out to Iraq said what could he do to help with uh, protecting and preserving cultural heritage. So I said, 
there's two things I think that need to be done. One is to conduct a survey of archaeological sites, and the second is to go and look at the museums uh, in your region to see what can be done uh, for them and how many of them uh, need to be restored and so on. So he said, fine. I didn't hear anything more about it for a few months. And then uh, I learned that he'd appointed Hugo Clark as the project manager. Major Clark initiated Operation Bell, a name inspired by Gertrude Bell, the famous British writer, Arabist explorer and archaeologist, who, while Oriental Secretary at the British High Commission in Baghdad during the mandate, devoted herself to establishing the first Iraq Museum in Baghdad before her death in 1926. After a study of the various heritage sites, it was concluded that the best option was to develop a new museum in Basra. Well, we were trying to find a place which would really be the right, the suitable building to be a museum for Basra. We hadn't decided whether the old museum in the old part of town was going to be tenable or not. That, that decision hadn't yet been made. And when we made that decision, we were trying to find where Gertrude Bell had lived and find a place to a connection to Gertrude Bell. And it was only when we really kind of, kind of came across the palace, we thought, yes, secure location, um, a connection to the heritage of Iraq. This is a place which could be taken forward. The British Army suggests to leave the uh, palace's complex in Basra. And we heard that in the news and, you know, in the meeting. And I have an idea, I say, okay, why not asking the local government to get one of the palaces to be as a museum? There was a meeting between the British Army and the Basra Provincial Council chairman. And there was suggestion from Mr. Barney White Spana for taking one of the palaces to be as a museum. So same idea was met in the same place, from the Iraqi side and from the British side. The selection of the Lakeside Palace for the new museum posed the question what to do about the hundreds of Saddam Hussein's many self-proclaimed titles liberally distributed across the fabric of the palace. One of these, Saddam Fakhr al-Arab, Saddam the Pride of the Arabs, decorated prominently the ceiling in the entrance. One of the really challenge in front of us to get the building. I remember the first meeting with the media, Iraqi media, after we suggest the, the project. There was a question asking me, what about the Saddam Hussein names in the building? You have to remove it because this is a bad memory for Basari and Iraqi people. I say, no, that's not true. We have to keep it because this is history. Black or white, it's not my work. I'm an archaeologist. I have to protect things as it is. We don't have to play with And then if you will tell your children and kids, there was Saddam Hussein, you know, uh, regime, and he was doing uh, palaces, and we are, we was really hungry. We cannot find bread to eat or, you know, food to eat. And he was doing these palaces. And you remove all the evidence, you will be lying in front of your kids. We have to keep everything for future. Beginning of 2010, they accept to give us the building, central government. It was at this point in 2010 that a group in Britain interested in Iraq founded a UK registered charity called Friends of the Basra Museum with the object of raising funds to help the Iraqi authorities finance the project. Enough funds were generously donated from UK sources, notably by the BP Foundation, to fund the first phase of the refurbishment of the palace, according to a plan agreed between the two sides with the technical advice 
of British consultants established in Basra, led by Peter Hunt. They got money not enough. First, we was, you know, the aim was three million dollars for the complete project. The first time we couldn't find that much. And so we have to change the plan on what we have only for the money first time coming from the British Petroleum. We have to arrange everything around this budget. 2014, while work was proceeding on the refurbishment and the preparation of the Basra Gallery of the museum, so-called Islamic State or Daesh forces overran large parts of northwestern Iraq, destroying wantonly in the process many cultural heritage sites. To the Basra Museum team, this acted as a spur to press ahead with their project and a date was set to open the Basra Gallery to the public in 2016. Daesh destroyed the Mosul Museum. We suggest to open the Basra Gallery. It's just kind of message if you destroy the museum in the north, the Basra doing a new museum in the south. At the same time, we was in a war, we was working for doing a museum. And that's difficult. I mean, no many countries can thinking for the cultural heritage in the crisis time, you know. That was really give us a passion and, and a stronger to do the, the museum. Because of unforeseen budgetary problems on the Iraqi side, the completion of the project would not have been possible without a substantial grant from the newly established UK Cultural Protection Fund, managed by the British Council. Joan Porter McKeever joined the Friends of the Basra Museum in 2016 to administer and oversee the funding of the remaining three galleries with a view to an official opening in March 2019. The charity enabled the Iraqis to complete this project and to complete a new museum in southern Iraq that hasn't had a museum for almost 30 years. And we gave them the resources, but frankly, they did most of the work. It was a collaborative project. Obviously, you know, we helped a lot, but they can be very proud of the fact that they achieved it rather than being top down. It was really something driven by the Iraqis. I think that's wonderful. Selecting suitable artifacts from the vast collection in store at the Iraq Museum and safely transporting them to the south of Iraq was a logistical and security challenge. Installing them in their display cases with appropriate labeling was also a huge task for the Iraqi team. The story started in the storage of the Iraqi museum. When you go to the storage of the Iraqi museum, you lost a million of objects. And I was telling them, look, I won't tell you a story. In 1990, Basra Museum was looted. All the museums around Iraq was looted. Basra Museum was looted 50%, and 50% of the object was sent to the storage of Baghdad Museum. And what happened? 2003, the Baghdad Museum was looted, and the object sent by the Basra Museum in 1990 was looted too. In the morning, when you are going to the storage, I have to bring a new uh, approval from the head of SBAH. The previous one for last day, it's not worth. A new one every day. When I enter, I have to sign. I have to give fingerprints, they have to check me all, they have to make a camera things and then go inside. When I go out, the same things, all I have to do it again. When I select object, I will leave and the other staff, they have to send it to the 104 room upstairs for clean and some object going to the laboratory and then registration and this, you know, very complicated system. 
first time Iraqi army was helping for transporting of the object artifacts from city to city and they gave approval for a C-130 plane, the big one, for cargo. From the museum to the airport was the most difficult time because only the staff, me with some colleague from Basra and the other staff from the Iraqi museum, all this very heavy, the statue and you know other uh, things was very heavy to transport. In Iraqi museum, there is no tools and the machine can help you to hold these things. The transportation, you know, still artifact will be broken or some damage will happen. All of these things, 4,000 objects belong to my guarantee. So I signed for everything. At the main gate of the army airport, we spent six hours just from the gate of the airport to the plane because there was a problem for the, with the approval. At the airport, inside the airport, another, you know, step. We have to take off all the packages from the uh, lorry and then the army, this is the army war. The army was a perfect, you know, uh, experience of packaging the things. They was really perfect. They put everything on the plane. The captain was from Basra. He was very helpful and very good with us. That mission, I mean, we started at 8 o'clock in the morning till next day afternoon. The strong support from the British friends, but the work on the ground, it's by local staff only. Everything was done in this building was by Iraqis. Parts of it are things of beauty. The galleries are beautiful. The display cases are beautiful. Seeing Iraqis just sort of be amazed and feel so proud that this is in their country. Anybody coming to the museum for the first time will be absolutely astonished at the quality and quantity of the material that's there on display. The one that I think is quite special is a Parthian bearded marble statue from Hatra, which is in, in the Basra Gallery, and it's in the first case as you walk in because that was in the original Basra Museum that was looted in 1990. And it went back to Baghdad and it's been kept in Baghdad. And when Katan al-Abid and Lami al-Gailani were trying to sort these things, his goal was to bring back as much from the original Basra collection as he could. And I think the idea that that is returned, because they could easily have said, oh, it should go to Hatra, but they, they did return it. For me, that is very important. in the Babylon gallery is um, these stone duck weights and they're absolutely beautiful polished basalt stone and there's one particular case this is the gallery that has very vibrant orange and one day I took a picture of two young men who were looking at these two duck weights. The young man had a black t-shirt on with the orange and just watching these young men studying their heritage with their sort of modern look it just brought out these two objects to me in a really emotional way. I was very uh, intrigued by a, a statue which had been placed in the museum uh, foyer, which had actually been found at Hatra. You know, it's this uh, wonderful caravan site west of Mosul in about 1st, 2nd century AD. It's a sort of uh, trading station um, on the Silk Road. There was a, a very prosperous civilization there, and the very wealthy rulers of Hatcha had lots of statues of themselves made uh, in stone, which they placed in all of the various temples in uh, Hatcha. And uh, Khatan selected one of those uh, in Baghdad to be brought down to Basra. It's probably a statue of one of the kings of Hatcha. And while this chap never himself, obviously, uh, ever came to Basra. It was about in his time that the city of Basra was um, originally founded. And there's no doubt that there were a lot of trade connections going uh, through the Gulf, up through Mesopotamia to the north on the one hand, and then across the desert to uh, places like Palmyra and uh, Damascus. Uh, in, in the other direction. So I think it's rather nice to have this statue there because uh, it shows uh, lots of different things um, for me. It, it reminds us that Basra was founded at, at about this time. 
It reminds us about these long distance trade contacts at the time that this king lived. And also it's a reminder that the museum has a wider reach than just looking at the city of Basra, that it is looking at the whole of um, Iraq. So I'm very pleased that it's there in the foyer of the museum in a prominent place. While the museum has provided a valuable source of employment in the local community, both for the specialist craftsmen who restored the building and the team overseeing the work and running the museum since the opening, it has also inspired a group of over 50 volunteers called the Iraqi Friends of the Basra Museum to give generously of their time in supporting its future work with ongoing funding and training provided by their counterpart friends in the UK. I'm happy to be in Basra Museum as a volunteer and to, to make the others know that there is a museum in Basra. Uh, so many uh, people, they didn't know. I feel that this is my job. For this reason, I try to bring uh, groups of ladies and girls to see this uh, museum. The first time to see these objects, they feel really, really happy. They ask me about everything. And uh, there was a gallery uh, have uh, some accessories for ladies. They love it. And ask about this, you know that. The jewelry, uh, the jewelry, the necklaces. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Basra Museum has become more than just another museum in Iraq. Under Tahtan al-Abid's direction, with the support of his staff and team of volunteers, the museum is developing into a cultural hub for the celebration of local arts and artists, old and new. At its heart is, most importantly, the learning centre, for it is through public education and outreach that the museum's future and Iraq's ancient cultural heritage will be safeguarded. We have done several activities with Basra Museum, helping the team in Basra Museum with the labeling and the translation and working with big names like Victor Lemmy Al Gailani and John Curtis on that in, in Amman. That was really the best part of the whole uh, program. You know, it's rare in life when you feel that what you are doing is really adding a great value. While I was working, we were working with them, I, I had the feeling that, you know, all of this information will stay for generations and generations for people in Basra and in Iraq. So it was really a great feeling uh, to help in that, really. And we held one of the biggest festivals in the museum, in the building, that was created by the Iraqi volunteers called the Friends of Basra Museum. First, to support the uh, craft uh, making in, in Basra because we have so many big number of, uh, you know, those with uh, small projects or Instagram pages who are doing different things. So Qahtan thought that we should bring them all and make an exhibition there for them for their work. There was another exhibition for artists and uh, we also had a very nice music played by a Basra artist also. I remember one of the academic and colleagues of Qahtan was uh, presenting one of his studies about the hanging gardens, just resolving the secret of how water was delivered there into those gardens. The learning center needs to become the heart of the museum. 
because really to start with the children is the future of the museum. I think the learning room, the whole design, how it was prepared, I think it's perfect to have more engagement with schools. Upstairs, there will be a research library that should be very well developed. So hopefully that will become something for the future of the museum to bring people in. For international visitors, we're hoping there will be at some point a digital tour through the museum. The Lakeside Palace in Saddam Hussein's time was set in an area physically separated from the public by a secure perimeter, admission into which was by a guarded gate. After nearly 25 years of Saddam's brutal rule, ordinary Iraqi citizens would not have dreamt of going through the gate to enjoy the extensive compound on the beautiful Corniche along the Shat al-Arab. Old memories and feelings endure, and crossing this gate today represents for Iraqis so much more than merely entering once forbidden territory. They are crossing emotionally into a new, more accessible era in their long history. Basically, this area, the whole area, it's more like an emotional plucket when it comes to being there at this area where all the palaces were there. It's different now, but they, they, they are still not feeling very comfortable in the beginning to be there, you know, especially there is like a big gate. Just to cross that gate was big for, for all people. Uh, this is all related to a long history of being under uh, Saddam's government. However, I have noticed, especially after the cultural and social events that were held there, people would have a very different view and they would enjoy the view because Shat al-Arab is along the Corniche, but the best part of Shat al-Arab is within the palaces area. So I remember seeing all of those young men and women uh, being there taking pictures and feeling very comfortable to be at, uh, at the museum. So to see this building change into a museum and to see actually what that means for the local people, I think that's a really powerful, powerful thing. Well, none of the many people uh, involved in this project uh, in Iraq uh, or in the UK uh, imagined at the beginning that it would take over a decade to bring it to fruition. And the fact that everybody has stuck to the task and completed it in such a splendid way uh, speaks volumes, I think, for the close working harmony that there's been between the two sides. Uh, and of course, they have a shared belief in the value of this museum uh, for posterity. Well, although the museum is now fully functioning, uh, there still does remain a lot to do to build up uh, its long-term resources. And the Friends of Basra Museum here in the UK uh, are going to continue to offer training, advice and support, uh, with the backing, of course, of the British Institute for the Study of Iraq, under whose aegis we now operate.